dear faith leaders, dear participants, it's such an enormous honor to be here today for the launch of this declaration proclaiming the sanctity of life and the dignity of all people, regardless of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. I wish to warmly congratulate the Global Interfaith Commission on LGBT plus lives for this initiative, and in particular, its co-chairs, the Bishop of Liverpool, Right Reverend Paul Bayes, and former senior rabbi to reform Judaism, Rabbi Laura Jenner Klausner, as well as the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for its support to this initiative. I have the great honor of being the independent expert on protection from violence and discrimination on matters concerning sexual orientation and gender identity. And in that position, I have had the opportunity of hearing from thousands of persons, many of whom have expressed to me that one of their most significant wounds in their struggles to live as gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans or, bisex or, or otherwise uh, gender diverse persons is the fact that so many messages around society have denied to them the possibility of them being spiritual beings. This declaration and the work that you have undertaken is of an enormous significance in this relation and I commend you for it. We have a great, great agenda before us if we are to achieve freedom and equality for all. Unfortunately, my reports show that in all corners of the world, LGBT people continue to remain excluded and marginalized. Violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity are perpetrated in the widest variety of public and private settings against LGBT persons. My findings come time and time again to one fact. A number of structural processes have been put in place in societies all around the world to perpetuate the notion that certain genital configurations determine a certain role in society and guide who you must love, feel attraction to or desire. This primal ordering principle has been instrumentalized through a series of mechanisms that I have come to qualify as negation and stigma. The latter translated in phenomena that I also describe as demonization, criminalization, and pathologization, sin, crime, and illness. It is my view that the great proportion of violence and discrimination perpetrated every day around the globe against LGBT people has a connection to one or several of these mechanisms, which have been in some cases been in operation for centuries and have then carved deep grooves in the collective consciousness of people everywhere. We are facing renewed backlash in this context and all over the world, political campaigns, parliamentary debates and public manifestations reveal social prejudice and misconceptions about the very nature and the very moral character of LGBT persons. We are also seeing the rise of ultra-conservative and ultra-nationalist groups reclaiming so-called identities at the expense of sexual and gender minorities, challenging advances and preventing the development of laws and policies inclusive of LGTB people. LGTB people, LGTB issues are often instrumentalized by leaders as a threat to national cohesion culture or tradition, in particular during periods of political and socioeconomic instability. Dear friends, excellencies, respected persons all, I cannot stress enough the importance of your work in this context, because one of those mechanisms operates precisely on the denial of the capacity of LGTB people to be of good moral character and ultimately to be good citizens. Together, we work now to prevent that LGTB people become the other, 
whose sole purpose appears to be, or is claimed to be, to undermine national projects from within. As a consequence of which, at school, they will face abuse and will face discrimination in all regions and in all stages of employment. They will also face discrimination in access to housing as a result of unfair treatment by public and private landlords, state agencies and credit providers. They will also face significant health disparities that are documented in several places of the world. Barriers such as criminalization of consensual same-sex activities, still a reality in 69 countries of the world, and the pathologization of LGTB people too often render health services unavailable, inaccessible, or unacceptable. And pathologization and criminalization actually extend their impact to all realms of life. And my mandate, as well as many others who are working in this field, have now provided ample evidence of the impact of these mechanisms, particularly criminalization and pathologization, in access to every sector of life and in the perpetuation of these cycles of violence. Two of my reports deal precisely with the issue of criminalization and conversion therapy, and I am absolutely delighted and very thankful that your work has also identified these issues as issues in which calls for global action are fundamental. I commend you for that statement that you have issued in relation to that. We have very recently celebrated yet another anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This extraordinary instrument that while universal in nature, also required to actually draw from all of the great cultures and great spiritualities around the world. It's therefore no surprise that's one of the pillars upon which all of the work, all of the framework created by the Declaration is very much based on the notion of human dignity. A notion that has very particular manifestation in the material world, but also in transcendence. I believe your declaration announces points of contact between all of these angles, all of these perspectives, and provides us a wonderful point of departure to provide answers to those who will want and must reclaim their identity as spiritual beings. Thank you very much.